Hello and welcome to the Opera and Common Core webinar. I am Leah Wilson. I'm Director of Learning and Engagement here at Opera America, and we are streaming from the National Opera Center here in New York. And today's webinar will explore the Common Core state standards and also discuss the value of opera programs in achieving Common Core learning goals. Um, today's webinar is informed by a statement that was recently developed by a working group made up of education directors at Opera America member companies. Throughout that process, uh, the working group found that the Common Core state standards align quite naturally with what arts, arts organizations are already doing. And it provides a common language for opera companies um, for when they're engaging with schools and stakeholders in supporting student achievement. Um, today on the webinar, I'm joined by Brandon Gride. He's our Opera, um, Opera America's Director of Government Affairs. And Sandra Rupert, also in DC, the Director of the Arts Education Partnership. Also on the line, I have Jill Burnham, Education Manager at Los Angeles Opera, and Barbara Lynn Jamison, Youth Programs Manager at the Seattle Opera. They'll join us later for a discussion on how they've explored the Common Core at their own companies. Um, if you would wish to submit any comments or questions to any of us on the panel today during the webinar, just um, type them into the comments box on the events page. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn to Brandon, um, who will tell us a little bit more about what Opera America has done in this arena and um, the arts education context that opera companies need to know about. All right, Brandon. Thank you, Leah. I uh, just wanted to provide a little bit of an overview of the policy work that Opera America is, participates in. Uh, as many of you know, Opera America is very active in advocacy at the federal level for many of the issues that impact not only the field of opera, but nonprofit performing arts, broadly speaking. Uh, we represent our members in front of Congress, the White House, and federal agencies. A lot of our work is through coalitions. Uh, we are, uh, Opera America is a founding member of the Performing Arts Alliance, and we work closely with our colleagues at Dance USA, the League of American Orchestras, Theater Communications Group, Association of Performing Arts Presenters, and many others. We work on a variety of issues that include not only uh, National Endowment for the Arts, but also charitable giving incentives for nonprofits, uh, efficient visa processing for foreign guest artists, international cultural exchange issues, and even protection of wireless microphone users. Um, and just to break that down a little bit more, this means that we're working not only with NEA, but also with the IRS, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the U.S. Department of State, and the Federal Communications Commission. And of course, the uh, Department of Education. So with the Department of Education, the, the issues that we are really focusing on are um, working uh, are two different areas. Uh, so we advocate for funding for uh, to the arts and education program at the Department of Education. Uh, it's the only dedicated funding to arts and education. Uh, a couple of years ago, funding to the arts and education program was uh, decreased from $40 million down to around $25 million. Uh, in fact, in 2011, when funding for many of the other programs at the Department of Education was eliminated, the Arts and Education program was the only program whose funding was reinstated. So we've found some really wonderful support in Congress around this issue. The President's budget has uh, repeatedly proposed a consolidation of programs, of a variety of programs, under a broader pool of funding called Effective Teaching and Learning for a Well-Rounded Education. Uh, the pool of funding we combine support for the arts uh, with health education, foreign languages, uh, civics and government, history, and many other subjects. Unfortunately, the proposed amount for funding that would go to this line item decreases each year with the president's budget. Uh, and the proposed budget for next year is $75 million for That would be for fiscal year 2014. This, of course, means not only less fun money available for the arts and education programs, but also the potential that, given a choice, uh, individual, you know, systems that are applying for this funding might opt out for, uh, to apply for funding for arts and education. Uh, Opera America and our arts national service colleagues are asking Congress to support a budget of $30 million for arts and education. Uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee did recommend funding the program at $27 million for fiscal year 2014, uh, even though the House and President's budgets have eliminated this line item uh, for funding. Uh, the other item that we uh, advocate for is we also urge Congress to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act uh, that's also known as No Child Left Behind. Um, 
and we urge them to continue to include the arts as a core academic subject. The House tackled uh, ESEA in July with a variety of opera, uh, with a variety of proposals, and Opera America actually signed on. And this is where we do some of our work on behalf of our members. Uh, we signed on to a letter that was sent from the Performing Arts Alliance to Representative George Miller from California. That's a purport that support that supported a variety of his proposals that expanded access to the arts uh, and urged him to ensure that eligible uses for Title I funds are clear for state policy leaders, uh, to add art and design to the definition of STEM program activities, and to name the arts as an eligible activity related to expanded learning time initiatives. Uh, additionally, in August, Opera America signed on to a letter from uh, the College Career and Citizenship Ready Coalition that promoted well-rounded language in Senator Harkin's ESEA reauthorization bill. The letter supports equal access uh, to a complete education that includes instruction in reading, math, science, arts, history, civics, and other subjects that are essential for any graduate to be considered ready for higher education and the workforce. Uh, as you're probably aware, Congress has uh, a very full plate this fall, uh, but I really encourage you to check in on the advocacy section of the Opera America website for updates. Um, and just to know that we are a resource for uh, our members uh, on, on this issue and a variety of other issues. You can visit the Performing Arts Alliance website. Uh, again, we are a founding member and, uh, and leaders as part of that alliance uh, on, on many of the issues that we work on. The website is actually the Performing Arts Alliance. There's a the uh, .org. And you can visit the Evergreen Arts and Education campaign page that allows you to connect with your members of Congress on this issue or any other issue. Um, one of the other things that is a benefit to Opera America members that I think many people either don't know or they forget is that if you are going to be visiting the D.C. metropolitan area, uh, you can certainly reach out to me. Uh, I would suggest about two weeks in advance of your visit and let me know that you're going to be in the area and would like to meet with your members of Congress. I will set up a meeting for you uh, and to talk about any of the issues that we cover. Uh, I will go on the hill with you and also provide you with the issue briefs and uh, our current legislative ask, as well as uh, the most important talking points for your meeting. Um, the, so reach out to me if you need any kinds of resources, if you have any questions about how you can become more engaged in this issue or any of our other issues. Um, and I'll, we'll turn it back to Leah. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks for all that information. Um, as you can see, it's really important for uh, the opera field to stay on top of all of these trends as they develop, and that's why I'm really delighted that we have Sandra Rupert on the line today to give us an overview of uh, the Common Core state standards themselves. Um, Sandra brings with her over 30 years of experience working in nonprofits, primarily arts, education, and public policy, and has authored numerous publications. Uh, so Sandra, thank you. Thank you. It's delightful to be here. And I want to thank all of the folks at Opera America for hosting this webinar and inviting me to be a, a part of it. So uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my job during the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to provide you with an overview of the Common Core State Standards, uh, what they are, uh, how they were developed, and how they are being implemented. And then also what some of the implications might be for uh, those of us that are working in arts education. So let's get started with that. Um, first, a, a few facts about the Common Core itself. This is a process that was started actually in the spring of 2009. And the Common Core State Standards themselves uh, were released in June of 2010. They were a state-led effort. Uh, through the Council of Chief State School Officers, which AEP is a part of, and the National Governors Association through their memberships. Uh, the goal of the Common Core State Standards was really to create high standards for students that would be consistent across all states. So that if you were a student in Missouri and you moved to Minnesota, the standards would be the same and there would not be different expectations for learning. The Common Core State Standards is only about two subjects. It is English language arts and mathematics only. That's what's been branded and called the Common Core State Standards. 
to date, 45 and a half states and DC have adopted the Common Core state standards. Um, Minnesota has adopted only the English language arts standards. That's why we say 45 and a half, just to be completely accurate. Uh, secondly, a little bit about what the Common Core state standards are and what they are not. I think there's a lot of misperceptions out there uh, about this issue. Uh, the Common Core state standards are common. They are not national standards. They are consistent across states. That's why they are called common. And they are not national because each state had to adopt the standards itself. Uh, they focus on what is most essential in those two subject areas. They certainly do not describe everything that can or should be taught. And also they define what students should learn not and when students should learn them, but not how. That's left up to individual states and their school districts and individual schools. And then lastly, the Common Core state standards include both knowledge, uh, that is mastery of content in those two areas, as well as skills. And that's one of the things that's different about the Common Core from the standards that they are replacing because the Common Core state standards include what we call higher order thinking skills. And of course, these are some of the same skills that learning in and through the arts also teach. Now, I mentioned that 45 and a half states in DC have adopted the Common Core state standards. And for many, that can be considered the easy part of the equation. Uh, certainly the implementation of the Common Core is far more difficult. The saying, uh, the devil is in the details, certainly applies in, in this case. So every state has formal implementation plans for implementing the Common Core, and they're in different stages of implementation. One major component of the implementation is related to the student assessments of learning in the Common Core. And most states belong to one or, or both of federally funded assessment uh, consortium. Uh, one is the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, and the other one is the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. And the acronym for that is PARC. Now, most of st the states plan to implement th these assessments for student learning in the 2014-2015 school year. But if you've seen a newspaper recently, a couple of states have already been piloting the assessments. And as we fully expected, because the expectations are higher for students, students have, by and large, performed poorly on them. Um, Another component of the Common Core implementation is the educator effectiveness measures. Uh, obviously, with higher expectations for students come higher expectations for school uh, leaders and for teachers. Uh, so right now, there's a lot of work being done in states relative to the preparation and ongoing support of educators. And then a more controversial piece that's being implemented is connecting the student assessment results to teacher evaluations. So that's a little bit of the context. And it seems that this, these days that you cannot pick up a newspaper without reading about the pushback on the Common Core. But if you look closely at the articles and look closely at maybe what's going on in your state, you'll see that much of the concern is not about higher expectations for students. It's really about the implementation measures that go along with the adoption of the Common Core. So it's important to recognize that the Common Core is really one manifestation of what all states, whether or not they've adopted the Common Core, what all states are doing to transition 
to higher learning expectations for all students. And this is for, as we say, the 21st century and preparing students to live in a global economy. So the Common Core is for math and English language arts. And then the Next Generation Science Standards, which you may have heard about, were released in the spring. And so far, six states have adopted those. Most importantly for us is the revision of the voluntary national art standards. Uh, those were first developed in 1994 in dance, music, theater, and visual arts. And that revision is underway now, and we expect that they will be released in spring of 2014. The phrase most commonly used to describe these higher learning expectations for students is one that you've probably heard already college and career readiness. Now, how does this impact our work? Well, in order to be college and career ready, it's important that we break that down and be able to talk about students that need, in order to be successful in school, life, and work, that they need a complete and well-balanced education. And of course, that must include the arts as a essential component. So meanwhile, while the focus is on the Common Core State Standards, here are a few ways in which opera companies and other arts organizations that are involved in arts education can be uh, involved and informed. First of all, become knowledgeable about the Common Core and all the associated issues like student assessment and the new accountability measures. The Arts Education Partnership at www.aep-arts, on our website, we have a, a full section that is dedicated to uh, providing you with information about the Common Core State Standards as well as work being done to revise the art standards. There is an overwhelming amount of information that's out there, and what we're trying to do is help you make sense out of it for your own work. Additionally, I think we all have an opportunity, those of us that are working in arts education, to help reframe this conversation around college and career readiness. It must be more than just math and English language arts. So let's start talking about what a complete and balanced education looks like that includes the arts as an essential component. Additionally, we can also model the kinds of collaborations that are so important as part of a well-rounded education. That kind of collaboration in the classroom that involves arts teachers along with community arts organizations and teaching artists. This is what we are striving for in education and we in the arts have been doing this for a very long time. Another area is let's start demonstrating what works. And a key role here is for arts integration. We are already in our work linking to other subject areas and linking those with learning in and through the arts. So we can model, in fact, for some of the other non-common course subjects, how they can be incorporated into a complete curriculum. And then uh, also professional learning for educators. Teachers are being asked to teach differently and they need every instructional strategy that they can use. So arts integration strategies are incredibly useful for helping regular classroom teachers have another instructional arrow in their teaching instructional uh, quiver. And then finally, the assessment of student learning. These new assessments, as I mentioned, are slated to roll out in most states next year. But in addition to test scores, what other ways, what other multiple measures that can demonstrate student proficiency? So this is a place where our student assessments can help inform those multiple measures for both students and also in teacher evaluation. So that's a basic outline and framework of some of the elements of the Common Core, what they are, what they aren't, and how we in the arts can be a part of that conversation through our own good work. Thank you very much, Sandra, for providing that great overview. And I'm sure most of you on the line can relate to a lot of what Sandra said with your own programs and how you are seeing your programs contribute to a complete education at this great work that you're doing at schools. Um, I'd like to go through a few um, 
slides with you now of, and that outline our process as we develop the statement. Um, that statement can be found at operaamerica.org slash common core. Um, so first of all, as many of you know, um, K-12 education programs have been a vital and growing part of what opera companies do. Across the country, um, opera companies are offering an impressive range of programs. They generally reflect three areas, um, the first being creating and performing opera, the second, learning about opera, understanding repertoire, um, composers, uh, student, uh, the social context, um, and also attending performances. The third area is um, opera career readiness, where students are engaging with opera practitioners, um, with learning about technical and administrative skills. Um, you can refer to Appendix A of the statement for further examples. Um, at our most recent opera conference uh, in Vancouver, we held a session dedicated to Common Core that was led by a consultant, Susie Watts. Uh, following that presentation, a working group formed to review the standards, um, and we also reviewed the existing literature um, that exists out there in arts education and engaging with Common Core. We're looking for natural alignment. Um, the methodology we used was quite similar to what the National Coalition for Core Arts Standards is doing, um, where we're first looking at explicit references um, in the standards to arts and opera components. Um, and then we look at broader, um, broader ideas, specifically in the anchor standards. The anchor standards are the key ideas that are behind the more specific progress that students make at each grade level. Um, and also the introductory sections to both the English language arts and math sections. And in those broader areas, we're looking for habits and skills um, in those standards that are similar to the skills that students would exercise in opera learning programs. Um, and a certain note, just to highlight what Sandra, Sandra said, is that the Common Core does not dictate exactly how that is taught. Um, and over the years, as you know, opera programs um, are very much on their own to determine how they're delivering those programs and the content with which um, they're teaching. So um, a lot of it is, is right for natural alignment. The standards offer um, an outline for specific skills and practices, analyzing, reflecting, that align with creative practices, um, imagining, investigating, constructing, and reflecting. Um, so I'd like to go through a little bit um, about the college and career readiness um, that Sandra mentioned and how that relates to opera programs. Um, in the introductory section of the English language arts, um, there, it outlines a portrait of students who have met standards that would demonstrate college and career readiness. And it lists uh, these qualities. Um, and for one, it's demonstrating independence, building strong content knowledge, understanding perspectives and cultures. Um, these are all behaviors and abilities that align really naturally with the learning goals and opera programs. Um, and now we'll look at a um, couple more specific um, standards. Um, these are ones that show direct connections and have explicit references to elements of opera. Take this one for example. Describe how words and phrases supply rhythm and meaning in the story, poem, or song. Um, and I'm going to pause here just for a second to note, um, to make a quick note on the notation that Common Core makes. Um, you'll see that kind of code up at the top of your screen. Um, this is a grade-specific standard, and CCSS is Common Core State Standards, ELA, English Language Arts and Literacy, RL stands for Reading Literature, that's a section of ELA standards, and the 2 is for Grade 2, Standard 4. Um, You'll also see codes for anchor standards, which are indicated with a CCRA. Um, just a couple other um, ELA standards that do have direct connections. Um, for example, um, explain major differences between poems, drama, and prose. Um, describe uh, or refer to the structural elements of poems. Um, analyze multimedia elements that contribute to the meaning, tone, and beauty of a text. And understand how language functions in different contexts. Um, these are all connections that really um, reflect the inherent level of opera um, at the art form level. Now what about different opera programs and different elements of those programs? I'll 
show you a couple more examples. Um, so take, for instance, uh, opera repertoire. Um, when students are looking at Carmen or Aida, um, they might be engaging with the figurative meanings of the text, um, analyzing the word choice that the librettists use, um, understanding how two different texts can identify the same themes or how different approaches, um, how different authors take different approaches. Um, when they are writing librettos and writing narratives, that connects directly with some of the writing standards and writing routinely over time is an example. Um, with singing and acting exercises, students are building their foundational skills in reading where they're understanding spoken words, syllables, and sounds. Um, also, some programs offer students activities where they are writing opinions about operas that they're seeing. Um, or the, the librettos that they're studying. Um, this is where students can use evidence to support an argument that they're making. Um, lastly, on the English language arts standards, I want to point out standard 10, which um, has, it says students should know a range of texts and um, build a depth of knowledge. This calls for a staircase of increasing complexity. And there's two types of texts that they're referring to. The first is literary texts um, that refers to folk tales and legends and, and literature in general. Many operas have been based on these. Um, and there's an appendix in the standards themselves that gives you examples of certain grade-specific texts. Um, there's also informational texts. And opera has a role to play here. Um, there's opera history and books on technical and production aspects. Um, so the working group um, came up with a list of opera-related texts for both of these categories that is organized by grade level. Um, and that can be found in Appendix B of uh, the, stand, uh, the statement online. So switching gears to math, um, now, again, there's both broad and specific connections to be made. At the broad level, um, there are practices that the standards outline in math. For instance, making sense of problems and persevering in solving them, looking for structure, making use of structure, critiquing the reasoning of others, or attending to precision. These are all concepts that are very well established in the study and creation of arts as well. Um, but on a more uh, practical level, some opera companies are offering the direct application of math skills. For instance, when um, they have students uh, learn about costume design and pattern making, and students that need to look at set models uh, that need to scale and fit different size stages. This directly connects with the standards on uh, measurement and data. And it also provides real work, um, real experience in uh, problem solving that connects to career readiness. Um, so to summarize, um, how are you navigating the Common Core and relating it to your programs? Um, I, uh, some recommendations are that if you look both for explicit references in the standards, but also those general practices. I've heard it, people refer to old standards that um, outline the nouns of what students need to learn in the Common Core delightfully focuses on the verbs. And so I, I encourage you all to look at the verbs that Common Core uses and see how those align with your programs. Um, I'd also encourage you to tease out of the standards those that align inherently with your art form and those standards that can align with particular components of your programs. Um, start first with the practice and then see how that applies to specific repertoire in your season or production elements backstage um, or other parts of your programs themselves. And lastly, opening that dialogue with teachers that's so important. Um, and there's so many multidisciplinary elements of opera. There's so many ins for students. And opera learning has a way of reaching students that maybe traditional instruction cannot. Um, there's also some standards that we've demonstrated here that are just so inherently opera aligned that an opera specialist or opera program is just so particularly well suited to teach that standard. So find out from the teachers what their needs are. At this point, I'd like to bring into the conversation um, Jill and uh, Barbara Lynn, who we have on the line. 
and hear from them about how they've used Common Core and um, in their conversations with schools. Um, so Jill and Barbara, uh, what have your conversations been like with schools? What are they grappling with in this first year of implementation? And how, how do your programs address their needs? I would say, uh, I would probably um, say, uh, refer to what you said a, mo a moment ago about the nouns and the verbs. I think sometimes um, the cha changing perspective or ch just change itself from, from the normal or the former way of thinking can be a challenge. And just opening um, your mind to a different way of thinking. You mentioned the nouns and the verbs, and I think that that's um, a, a really perceptive thing to consider changing just the perspective of approaching a certain subject itself. Um, one of the things that I think is really exciting about this moment, if you don't mind if I jump in, um, is that there is such tremendous upheaval in the uh, world of education since the recession hit, and I can only speak for California and Los Angeles specifically, but the arts were really de decimated and devastated. and. Funding is starting to, the economy is starting to recover out here. Funding is coming back in. And people are ready to start a conversation about arts integration. And having the Common Core Standards as a common point of language is making conversations with principals and teachers a lot easier. Uh, so I'm, I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity for us as, um, as uh, arts providers. Right, thanks. And um, since we're shifting into a more discussion format, I would encourage you all to submit your comments. And Audrey, my colleague over here, the digital media manager, will be collecting those comments and will um, we'll pass them out to us at the end. Um, so back to Jill and Barbara, um, what would you recommend to opera companies that are developing new programs to align with Common Core? Um, well, we've recently. Uh, um, really reimagined one of our programs specifically around Common Core. We do a series of professional developments for teachers throughout the school se school year, and one of the series that we provide is called Opera 101, which is intended to be sort of an introduction to the art form and ways to make connections to curriculum. But this year we have organized it around major themes in opera, and. Then we have we're partnering with Los Angeles Unified's Arts Ed Branch, and the head of the Arts Ed Branch is working with the teachers for an hour and a half in, after the presentations to actively talk about arts integration through the Common Core and pull ideas out of those presentations, those multidisciplinary presentations and perspectives on opera, and look for uh, spark points for lesson plans, look for ways to, cons you know, look for teaching strategies actively. So I, we're really excited about that. We have the first class in October. I would say, um, to piggyback on what Jill has just said, that being familiar with what the standards say is probably the very first step, just to know what's there. Um, there is language there that so readily speaks to what we do in the arts that, that it's often pretty pretty apparent those to make, how to make those connections. But in knowing what's there, we are empowered with the vocabulary to speak with teachers and principals and other educators, um, and and it it can bring some some opportunities just by being familiar with those. Um, I would also say in that, too, that you don't often have to go very far from what you've already been doing or what your, what your, what your goals are as a company. I think keeping those central is important because it's who you are. It's how you define yourself yes. as a company. It's it, um, if, you, if you base what, the work that you do very deeply in the skills that are represented there and the strengths you have, that um, you'll find these the, the most natural connections are the best place to start. And, um, and I think reaching out to people who can help you even find those if you're unfamiliar enough to know what that is, just to, just to speak with people about them, start to bring um, some natural connections to your right to your lap, actually. Now, Sandra um, spoke about accountability, where there's this, these kind of layers of accountability, first with the standards. Um, and it really challenges to think about quality. Um, what does quality arts education mean? Um, so first, we have standards, and the National Coalition is working on this. Uh, 
and student assessments is right around the corner, and then of course teacher assessment. So I'm curious, um, Jill and Barbara, how you're considering assessment. Has has Common Core State Standards impacted at all the language that you're using to assess your programs? Absolutely. Um, I think, again, we get back to the verbs uh, are, are a lot more present in our assessment tools. Also, um, we're, we're more aggressive about uh, directly linking each one of the questions in our assessments to where, where possible um, to a Common Core standard and a visual arts and visual performing arts standard so that when we show growth in the students um, learning as a result of our programs they uh, we give the teachers a copy of that document that shows this is kind of an overall and shows how many standards were addressed and the rate of increased knowledge so that the teachers have an advocacy tool right there in their labs. Mm -hmm. I think because the, the Common Core standards do highlight the sort of thinking that we've been, the sort of higher order thinking skills that are, are becoming um, so necessary for that, for readiness for life, uh, that we know that the arts have had for so long, it does give us a similar vocabulary, a similar way of assessing that the teachers that in the classrooms that we have worked with seem to have um, a, a different understanding now that they've had the language of the Common Core standards um, framing their work a little differently, so I think that um, it does it does it doesn't necessarily change our assessment, but I think it does change how we can frame our work in a in a familiar way um, and with familiar language. Yeah. Sandra, do you have any examples to share of um, particular arts education programs that are using Common Core in their own program assessment? Uh, well, actually, there is a lot going on around the country. Uh, there isn't any one place right now where one can go and see those exemplars of best practices. And we hope that something like that can be developed uh, over the next year. Um, I would say that we do have uh, on the AEP website uh, another connecting website called Arts Ed Search, and mm -hmm. that actually is a great tool for folks to take a look at as they go in and start thinking about making learning visible through the arts. Um, in there, you can see that there is very strong evidence connecting the arts to academic outcomes, particularly in ELA and mathematics, but also other cognitive outcomes which, as you mentioned, are kind of these anchor standards for both math and ELA, like creative thinking and critical thinking and problem solving, and then personal outcomes like engagement and persistence and self-awareness and self-expression, and then social and civics uh, outcomes, collaboration and communi uh, communication. So I would say, you know, looking at those parallels and that's what we're seeing in the best practices right now in arts assessment is when we're talking about college and career readiness, we're really talking about the arts as an essential component of that as well. Mm -hmm. Can I just also highlight uh, and emphasize the resource that Sandra just mentioned in that uh, for folks who haven't been to that website, you can also filter your search down to the type of discipline that you're looking for the type of age group that you're uh, addressing, and even, I think, if I remember correctly, Sandra, whether it's in-school or out-of-school type of programming, correct? So it's a really fantastic resource. That's correct. You can run a, a search, and all of this uh, research that's in here, you can feel confident that it meets the highest threshold for good research in any academic subject. So we don't hold the arts up to a, a lower level. And this is the kind of thing we need to be doing as a field so that we can be part of this larger conversation around what all students need to be successful in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, we know that teachers are going pr under uh, having professional development around Common Core. What opportunities would opera educators or arts educators have to have in-person instruction? Or are we on our own to, to self-curate our learning about this online? Are there, are there places that people can go to find out more? It, it, 
to find out more about uh, what some of the best practices are? and uh, Well, just about Common Core in general. Like, when we understand that knowledge is so important of just being well-versed in it, first and foremost. There is just a, a huge array of information that's out there. If just uh, in a general search would pull that up. I think one of the things that we've done on our website is curate the kind of the best of the best essential documents. Uh, mm -hmm. And many of those are links that could take people to uh, other websites um, because otherwise the amount of filtering and searching could could be endless. Yeah. But there are some terrific tools on there that will help you communicate with uh, both uh, teachers and uh, education leaders um, in a way that uses that common vocabulary. Excellent. Jill, have you seen examples of how, how teachers are getting up to speed in this and anything that you're taking away from that? Yeah, um, you know, there are, uh, and you're speaking specifically about Common Core and arts integration, or? No, just getting fluent in, in Common getting Core. Getting fluent in Common Core. Yeah. In, I know in LUSD, they're, they're saturating them with trainings, um, and yeah. most, of the other, um, most of the other school districts, too, because we've, of course, adopted the state standards, the standards for our state. But they're training teachers to then hub out and go into, other, into neighboring schools and train mm -hmm. other teachers in Common Core, which I have been invited to participate in, and I'm really excited about. Wonderful. I think it's a great resource. I mean, if I can quickly just name a couple of other um, great strategies I think for um, learning about this is uh, the arts, any arts coordinator at a school district is going to have Common Core and Arts Integration right in front of them right now and LAUSD is doing a bunch of trainings through the arts branch so I've been going to those and sitting in those trainings with yes. teachers and doing the activities together. It's a great resource um, and any district should have somebody who is appointed to take a look at that. Yeah. Great. So would you recommend that other people could maybe call them up and see what's possible for them to sit in on if those trainings are happening yeah. anyways? Absolutely. I think um, I think they'd be there they, it would it would be very, very welcome. They'd feel a, a lot they'd feel more even more relevant than they already are in yeah. their own work. So I, I encourage I think it's great community building as well. Barbara, any any thoughts on that? I think well, the districts are 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 really providing so much. I think that that's probably the most the the most um, efficient the effective way to get there. And and it's also going to be it's going to make those of who are able to attend those aware of what the issues are there locally as well. Everyone is going to have some different um, some different perspectives um, depending on your location and and the school districts that you work with. So I think Jill's absolutely right. I think that's the number one. Well, we do have one question that came in uh, from Ben Codwaller. Um, in your conversations with administrators and teachers, what level of specificity have you found to be most effective in selling your programs? For example, do you bring curricular examples? Do you cite specific standards? How do you start that conversation so that it's um, effective when you're talking to schools? I think I think yes and yeah yes yes and yes I think the more specific the better um, I think I think it's um, important to to show what we do understand about what they are they are doing in the classrooms and what their goals are I think being able to support this uh, to be able to cite the standards is a great place to start and I think if being able to explain how is also very important to teachers that we we know again the verbs and the nouns I go back to that because I think that's such a uh, an interesting way to think um, we have been doing a lot of um, of what what is the what is the actual subject matter and, and teachers are very very interested to know what that is and that can also open wonderful doors for collaborating with teachers and helping teachers prepare their students in the classroom for that work I think um, Principals do want to hear what's going to be accomplished and what the goals accomplished and how we're going to figure out if we have been successful. What are the actual objectives of the collaboration? When it is a collaboration, so not all programs are collaborative. Some are more um, performance-based. Mm -hmm. But knowing what those are is, is important. So whenever you can, cite those examples and be very specific about how you intend to, to meet your objectives and how you will know if those objectives have been met. Yeah. 
beautiful. Can I add, uh, add to that? That was so great. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that um, one of the things I'm hearing from my teachers a lot, because testing is so em uh, emphasized and um, assessment, is every minute is a teachable minute. So if you can articulate how the students are actively learning, and what they're, the, what they're actively learning, um, rather than it being passive listening or observing, um, just kind of to reinforce what Barbara said. Also, with reference to Ben's question, um, if you can get to know the culture of your school, uh, um, before you go in, it's helpful because if you know if you're dealing with teachers that ha have they ever intersected with any of your programs anywhere else? Do you need to make a presentation to the PTA? Like I work with a school that's particularly focused on academics and doesn't want a lot of arts integration in terms of the parent group. I went in and sold our program to them and it really <laughs> changed things for them. But um, but you know I, I, we have I make sure I forward an email with links to all the. Um, clips on our website of the work that we do because you want to get them energized and interested. There's lots of little tricks, but yes, bring bring examples, bring it all, I think. Great advice. Um, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. If you have them, there's still a few minutes left here in the hour. Um, a couple other topics that might be worth exploring either now or next time. This is such a big topic and there's so much to dive into. Um, is also considering elementary versus secondary standards. Um, a lot of our opera companies are serving kind of higher um, elementary grades, um, not so much um, high school, but there's there's so much that opera brings to a high school education as well. Um, so just thoughts on that. Um. Well, we work really d deeply with a lot of high schools um, in a few different ways. One of the things to think about is the fact that you're dealing with teachers that only have those students one hour a day, if that. So um, you're asking them to sacrifice a lot more of their uh, focus it, it, than you are the elementary teachers. So care and structuring and how you talk to them and the materials, I think, is important. As you saw the, um, this, in the standards, we looked primarily at the K through five because that's where the um, the standards make that break. Um, and so there is an opportunity to look farther at high schools and kind of see how high schools work much differently and see how opera can um, make better inroads there. Uh, Sandra, has there been any dialogue um, in in that separation and considering elementary versus secondary? Uh, yes, I think there has been, and one area in uh, post uh, in secondary education where I think we can be extremely helpful is you know teachers are hungry for multiple ways in which they can assess student learning, yeah. particularly in uh, subject areas that are not specific to the to the common core. And the uh, arts community is especially well positioned to help teachers think about different ways of learning and different ways of assessing student learning. So the use of demonstrations and portfolios and observations mm -hmm. and rubrics and the kinds of things that really we in the arts have pioneered. I think would be enormously helpful to teachers in secondary schools. And then secondly, I think this is an opportunity to establish that we are a serious discipline. Uh, we do have standards. Uh, we do have assessments. We do have ways of measuring student learning and student outcomes that are aligned with our standards. We have ways of being accountable for uh, our teacher evaluation. So it's again a part, an opportunity to be seen as to, a serious uh, discipline and academic subject. So I think in those two ways, both within our own discipline and how we can help uh, educators in non-arts disciplines uh, get better at both their instructional practice but also their assessment of student learning. Yeah. Leah, can I add something to that? Sure. We have time. Absolutely. Um, we have one of our programs has students returning multiple times to to see opera throughout the season, mm -hmm. and a tool uh, we I recently developed with a couple of teachers is a, a kind of. Um, 
continuing to advance the level at which we assess the kids so that we begin by asking them very basic questions about opera and opera knowledge and as those groups continue to return the, the, the questions change in nature they become more intense they assume uh, that the students have been, been having a um, sequential learning experience about opera and yeah. the te teachers are really excited about that yeah, project. I believe that um, the project-based assessment that can happen in a secondary classroom can be very exciting and can really pull in some some upper-level students in a way that they often we often change a little bit to more traditional academia for the for the upper levels mm -hmm. and forget the project base that happens much mm -hmm. more readily and often in the elementary schools and. Um, we can continue to pull these together for the secondary kids in a way that really makes, for the teachers as well, very exciting to, to continue to delve into the subject matter. Contributing to that real depth of knowledge that the standards are calling for. Yeah. The other thing, I, if I might add, is it, you know beyond kind of the knowledge and skill piece of this is something that I think the arts bring almost uniquely uh, to the conversation in education, and that is around the climate and culture of schools, which is particularly important when students get to the high school level, when we begin to see uh, the lack of motivation, boredom with learning, uh, just disconnecting from school itself, and we have so many students who are just quietly leaving school and not returning. So recognizing that uh, through our work, uh, particularly, uh, you know, opera I think is a wonderful example of that, of its ability to really change the climate and culture of, of a school and a way to engage parents and the community in a way that they probably wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Excellent point. Well, we are starting to wrap yes, up here, and I want to uh, refer our listeners to the slides. On the next slide, we have contact information for myself and for Brandon and Sandra if you have further questions. Um, and also give a big thank you to the working group that put in a lot of time and effort in reviewing the standards and highlighting examples from their own programs and from the field um, to really shape that statement and to bring you today's webinar. Um, so thank you all to the panelists and to my team here at Opera America, Audrey Saccone and Jackie Schiffer and Brandon Greid. Um, thank you all. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me at lwilson at operamerica.org. Um, and thank you. Until next time. <laughs>